Hello everyone, I'm Katie Skelton and I work for White Hat Security. I have done for just under two years. Thanks for this opportunity to speak at this awesome first B-Sides Belfast event. So today I'm going to talk a bit about XSS and why, despite it being a known vulnerability for so many years, that it still exists on a large majority of sites. At White Hat, just under 50% of, of websites that we see are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about JavaScript. So what is JavaScript? JavaScript is a scripting language that was created to work with HTML and CSS to provide interactive web applications. The HTML provides the content, CSS provides the look and feel, the design of the page, and JavaScript provides the behavior, the activity. Some things that you may have seen on a website that are done through JavaScript are things like event handling. So when you mouse over an image on a page and the image expands in size, this will be done through JavaScript. Another thing you might see is when you're signing up for an account on a site and there's a location for your phone number and you accidentally put in an O instead of a zero. If the form highlights that field in red and says input invalid, that will be done through client-side validation, which is done through JavaScript. So what does JavaScript have to do with XSS? So first of all, what is XSS? XSS, or cross-site scripting, is a web application vulnerability where an attacker is able to include malicious code and have it reflect on, the web, on a web page. XSS is where the attacker is abusing the trust that a user has for the website itself. The user believes that anything that's on that website should be there. Some places that, that attackers will look for identifying XSS are things like search functionality. If you search for something like shoes, and the response comes back saying, in, um, search results for shoes can be seen below. That is simply your user input being reflected on the page. Another place that you might see um, user input reflection would be something like your username. So for example, on Amazon, your first name is reflected when you sign in. It says something like, welcome Katie, to me. These are all locations that an attacker will look for potential XSS and try to put in their own piece of code to run malicious JavaScript. So the main language that is used to um, ex exploit XSS will be JavaScript. So what can an attacker do with XSS? One thing an attacker can do with XSS is steal valid session cookies. So let's say you're the victim and you're signed into your banking site, bank.com. An attacker has found XSS on bank.com and they've created a malicious injection that's designed to steal your session cookies. So when you authenticated to bank.com, you set up a session with the server that the server set, sent you a particular session cookie. So the attacker sends you the link with the valid injection in it. And when that injection fires, after you've clicked on the link, the session cookie is sent to the attacker. All the attacker needs to do is include that session cookie in their browser, navigate through bank.com. They can see everything that you see. The bank believes that they are you. They have control of all of your money. Another thing an attacker can do with XSS is to face web applications. For example, on a new site, if there's XSS on for um, a new site, it's possible to include an article that is not actually valid, something that the attacker has created. In 2006, CBS News and BBC.co.uk were both vulnerable to XSS. An attacker managed to create their own article state claiming that President Bush had appointed a nine-year-old boy to be the chairperson of in the Information Security Department. It was backed up by claims on CBS News and the BBC through the attacker's malicious injection on both of those sites. So to a normal person, maybe they don't trust the website that is the attacker's, but if it's backed up by CBS News and the BBC, who are they to question it? Another thing an attacker can do with XSS is redirect a user onto a malicious site. For example, you as the victim, are on your social media site, socialmedia.com, and the attacker finds XSS on socialmedia.com. They create an injection that is designed to redirect you to socialmedialogin.com. 
Now, socialmedialogin.com isn't actually owned by the company of socialmedia.com. It's hosted by the attacker. The attackers created this site to look exactly like the login form on socialmedia.com. The attacker sends you, the victim, a link containing their injection that redirects you to socialmedialogin.com saying, hey, look at this really cool post um, that I've just found. You, the victim, clicks on the link. You get redirected to a page that says, hey, you've been unauthenticated from socialmedia.com. Please sign in again. So you username and password, include your username and password and sign back in. If the attacker is smart, they'll redirect you actually to socialmedia.com to an actual forum post or whatever they've told you is there. But you, the victim, have just given the attacker your username and password. They can now sign into that account. You may not know, as the victim, that you have given away your username and password until you no longer have access to that account. So what's the solution for XSS? The best solution for XSS is two things, input sanitization and output encoding. These two things go together hand in hand. First of all, input sanitization is where the developer is checking all user input for key signs of malicious code. For example, less than and greater than symbols that represent a tag in HTML. The developer may strip those particular characters, therefore preventing an attacker from creating tags. Or they'll use output encoding. So output encoding is used for when the site requires special characters to be used. For example, a surname like O'Leary contains a special character, the apostrophe or single tick, depending on what you want to call it. In this case, the website should allow the single tick to be put in through the user input. But a single tick can represent a string in HTML. So to prevent the browser from treating it as syntax, the developer output encodes it in HTML encoding so that when the browser sees this encoding, it goes, hey, I'm going to display this as a single tick, but I'm not going to treat it as part of the code of the page. So together, both of these done properly will prevent XSS. Two other solutions that are commonly found on websites are whitelists and blacklists. So a whitelist is where a developer has said, I only want certain things to get through my user input. This is useful for something like a phone number, where the only thing you want um, in your user input would be numbers. But if your whitelist starts to contain too many um, special characters, it may be possible for an attacker to break through that whitelist and run their own malicious code. The alternative to that is a blacklist. A blacklist is where the developer says, these are all of the things that I don't want my user input to contain. So things like tag names or are less than and greater than symbols. But a blacklist can be extensive and quite commonly broken. This little cartoon here is a joke on what can happen if input sanitization is not applied on your applications. In this case, a parent has named their child something with an injection in it, and when the teacher included that child into their database, it dropped all of their students' information. It wiped all of that information, meaning they don't have it anymore. That is one problem with input, lack of input sanitization. So now we're going to talk a bit about some real-world breakable filters. Our first filter is to do with output encoding and some locations where particular output encoding does not prevent XSS. So in this case, the developer is preventing users for user input from containing our single ticks in plain text. So it's encoding it in hex HTML encoding. So our single tick becomes ampersand hash x27 semicolon. In plain text areas of HTML, this will work fine. The browser will simply treat that as the literal character. It will not it, treat it as syntax. However, in some locations, such as in an A tag, in an href, in this particular example, our first example here on the screen, the, the href is declaring JavaScript. So we're using the JavaScript scheme where our function, called function, 
is going to run when a user clicks on the click me that'll be visible on the page. In this particular example, our user input is highlighted in red. And if you look at the line below, you can see what it decodes to. So we've included a single tick, closing parenthesis, a semicolon, the function alert, opening and closing parentheses, and two forward slashes, which represent a comment in JavaScript. So what this is going to do is break out of the function that our user input is reflected into, close off that function, and call the alert function. This is a proof of concept that we can run JavaScript on this particular landing space. Another landing space that this type of encoding will work is something like on drag. If the user input is this, again, highlighted in red, our parentheses are hex encoded. And when a user drags the XSS that'll be visible on the page, the alert will fire. So here we're going to look at a quick example of this um, filter in practice. So here we are, our user input reflected. Um, we're first going to demonstrate that our user input is being HTML output encoded and won't be treated as actual syntax. So here we can't break out of the tag that we're in. So next up, we're going to include the injection from the previous slide, our single tick, closing parentheses, semicolon, alert function. And here we're going to click on the title and the alert fired. This is our proof of concept that we can run JavaScript in this particular landing space, HTML and hex encoded. Our second filter is when our user input is being reflected within a script block on an HTML page. In this case, the developer is preventing the user input from, block, from escaping the script tag. So for example, closing out the script tag with our less than symbol forward slash script greater than symbol. The developer might be just stripping the special characters or stripping the keyword script. In this particular case, the developer will be stripping the keyword script. There's two options that we have here. The first is closing out the JavaScript that we're reflecting into and putting in our string. So in our first example, um, we're in a variable and our user input is reflected within a string. So we're putting in our, sem our quote, our semicolon to end the statement, calling our alert function and commenting out the rest of the string that's left over. Now this works. It works in the majority of places. However, if, you're la if you're the user reflect reflection is landing in a large piece of script and functions inside functions, it can be really hard to fix the syntax when your user input is being reflected when you're putting in certain characters in your user input. JavaScript is key. JavaScript requires that the um, syntax be correct. Otherwise, none of the, the um, block of script will run. So this second injection, our quote star alert star quote, this is so much simpler, so much easier, because we're not breaking the syntax. We're not trying to break out of the function that we're in. So here, what we're doing is we're creating the string ABC, we're calling the alert function, and creating the string DEF. What JavaScript is going to do, it's going to notice that we've got a string, we're calling a function, and we've got another string. We're trying to combine them together using mathematics. So our stars could be replaced with minus signs, forward slashes, or pluses, depending on the mathematics you want to do. And what's going to happen is JavaScript is going to try and combine the ABC with the result of the alert function. But the alert function doesn't return a string. So after it's called the alert function, the JavaScript's actually going to error. But it's it's all right. It's it's too late. We've all, the attacker has already called has already called their function and their their input has their injection has fired. So here we're going to look at our Filter in action. So here our user input is reflecting in the same place as in our example on the previous slide. And here the developer is simply taking out the keyword script. 
If we put in our mathematics function, our alert fires immediately. Our next filter is about blacklisting. So we've talked a little bit about blacklisting. So in this case, our developer is preventing users from using certain event handlers and tag names. In this particular example, our developer only knows of a few tag, one tag and a few event handlers. So body, on click, and mouse over. This is a pretty short blacklist. Most blacklists on the web are going to be a lot more extensive than this. But for this quick example, here are three things that can get around that blacklist. So input on wheel, SVG on double click, image on MS pointer over. Im on MS pointer over is an IE 10 only um, event handler, but it'll still work for an attacker. These are just some of the many ways that we can break this particular blacklist. So here's an example of why a blacklist is a pretty bad idea. This is just some of the event handlers that we know, know of today. Um, it's quite extensive, there's, there's a lot of them. So when new versions of HTML are released, such as the most recent HTML5, new tags and event handlers become available for attackers to execute JavaScript on web applications. This means that there's more work for the developers who are maintaining this blacklist, but there's also room for error. Missing a single event handler could make your application vulnerable to XSS. It could be just misspelling an event handler. There's also the problem with how long it takes your de the developer to update the blacklist when new things come out. It could be a couple of hours. It could be a couple of months. It could be a couple of years that any web application relying on that blacklist, they could be vulnerable to XSS. Here is another example of our filter working. So our user input is being reflected in a plain text area of HTML. We're going to, dis ex we're going to show that the body on mouse over tag is simply being removed by the developer. If we include our input on wheel, When a user wheels over the input that will be displayed on the page, the alert fires. Another filter that we have is when the user input is reflecting in a hidden input field. The developer in this case is preventing the user input from escaping the input tag that the, Im the user input is reflected into. There are three things that an attacker could do here. The first on, our, on the slide here is a style injection. So our style equals x expression alert. This is going to call the alert function when the style attribute is applied. Lucky for us, or lucky for an attacker, style is always applied to every input tag, regardless of whether it's hidden or not. This is, however, an IE7 or lower vulnerability, which means that it's got a limited um, victim range. Sometimes, user input can be reflected before the type is declared in an input field. Something that HTML does is it takes the first attribute and ignores any duplicates. So in this case, an attacker is able to declare the type equals text. This input is no longer hidden. It's going to be visible on the page whether the developer wanted it to or not. They can then go and use any other event handler they, that the developer hasn't blocked. So on mouse over equals alert. When a user mouses over that input field, the alert fires. Our third way of getting an injection into a hidden input field is an attribute called access key. Creating an access key where we declare that a certain um, character on the keyboard is our access key. In this case, it's X. We use the event handler on click, give it the value alert, and when a user clicks the buttons Control alt x on a Mac or Alt-Shift-X on Windows, the alert fires. It's going to be a problem, but it would be possible to social engineer someone into clicking those keys to get something to, to happen. It would be pretty easy to tell someone, hey, click on these buttons and you'll see a funny cat picture. So here we're going to see another example of this hidden input field and examples of our access key. 
injection working. So first of all, showing that we cannot break out of the tag. So here we can see the developer is hex encoding the, le the greater than symbol so that we can close out the hidden input tag. So we're going to stay within the input tag and declare access key. So when the user clicks the appropriate buttons after this page is rendered, the alert will fire. There we are. In this particular example, we are also falling, the user input is also falling before type equals hidden. So just to give an example of declaring type equals text, as you can see, the, hit, the input field isn't visible on the page at this time. But there, the input field is now visible, and when the user clicks on it, the alert fired. Another filter that we've got is when a developer is filtering on, filtering on any tag. For example, when a less than symbol is followed by a letter, the developer will either strip out the less than symbol, strip out the tag entirely, or some other way to prevent the tag being rendered as a tag. Now, in plain text areas of HTML, this may prevent XSS, unless you're using IE9. In IE9, you can put in a percentage sign between the less than symbol and the letter, and IE9 will actually treat this as an actual tag. So we can, an attacker can use on mouse over equals alert. When someone mouses over the ABC that'll be visible on the page, the alert will fire. So here, another example. So here we're showing that our user input's reflected in plain text. We're going to show that any tag is not, is being filtered out all we're left with is the one, two, three of our input. Now, when we put in the percentage sign between the less than symbol and the tag name, we expect that user input to not be reflected anymore. It's being treated as an actual tag. So now if we put in the full injection from the previous slide, any tag on mouse over equals alert, ABC. There we are, ABC's on the page, alert fired. Just to demonstrate that this is actually being rendered on the page, we're gonna look at the source code just to prove that that tag is actually there. The final filter that I've got for you today is when a developer appears to be filtering on all special characters that, seem, that are required to exploit XSS. For example, quotes, le less than and greater than symbols, single ticks, pluses, and equal signs. This particular injection is landing in a document.write within script space. What's going to happen is the document.write is going to write this input onto the page when it runs. But we need those special characters to create the tag. So in this case, we can use hex entity encoding, which is our backslash x3c, is our less than symbol. We're creating an arbitrary tag name, xss, using the event handler on mouse over, backslash x3d is our equal sign. And in this particular case, the developer is actually blocking keyword alert. And so we're using this function called top that's going to combine the ale string with the rt string to create our function. So our backslash x27 is our single tick to create our string. Backslash x2b is our plus. And backslash x3e is our greater than symbol to close the tag. Now when a user mouses over the x is displayed on the page, the alert will fire. So again, we're going to see an example of this filter in place. So our user input is reflecting within a document.write. Just to verify that the user input cannot be used um, the special characters can't just be used normally, so we can't close out of the script tag. 
or yeah. So here we've completely removed some of the special characters and the keyword script. Including our injection from the previous page, our XSS on mouseover equals top alert with all our X's. We mouse over those X's and the alert fires. This is a fairly unique way to get in XSS on a page. It doesn't come up an awful lot where we reflect in a document.write. So today I've covered six different filters with yourselves. So output encoding, blocking closing script tag, blacklisting, hidden field where the developer is stopping you from stopping an attacker from escaping the input tag, filtering of any tag, filtering all special characters that seem that are required for XSS. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Thanks.